Betty Crocker service program, a regular feature of General Mills. Marching along together, sharing every fire and tear. Marching along together, wishing the skies are clear. Marching along together, life is wonderful side by side. Friends, the leader of this band of gallant home front women is Betty Crocker who comes to you now with a delightful account of one of our young war brides. For there is no group of women in America today who are having so hectic a time as these young wives of our servicemen. And of course, Betty Crocker has some recipes and menu suggestions planned especially for these young homemakers. But they are suggestions that are sure to be welcomed by homemakers of any age. So here she is, your Betty Crocker. Hello, everybody. I'm going to tell you a story today, a real story of love in wartime. The man in the story is a Marine named Tony. And the girl is young, attractive, and gallant. Her name is Lois. You'll get an idea of the character of young Marines in general if I go back for a minute. It was the day after that fateful attack on Pearl Harbor. Tony telephoned his mother that Monday afternoon. He was not quite 20 then. Hey, Mom. Things are looking pretty sharp. I... I quit college today and went over to the airport... I applied for enlistment in the Navy Air Corps. But I gotta have your signature, Mom. At that time, you see, boys had to be 21 to join the Navy Air Corps. Well, Mom signed the papers. And after Tony had been through six or seven months of grueling training at Corpus Christi, Texas, he elected to transfer to the Marine Corps to be a dive bomber. Then a few months later, he was awarded his Marine wings. And, of course, he became a second lieutenant on that day, too. He would have three more months' training before being shipped overseas. So Tony pondered, as thousands of young men do, to marry or not to marry. Lois was the girl he'd taken to all the college proms. The girl whose letters, when a fellow was in training, helped a lot. Oh, yes, there was the usual question in both families. Should the young folks get married now or wait for the security of peacetime? But the young couple decided for themselves as young folks have done from the beginning of time. Lois got a leave from her college and went down to Miami to marry Tony. There followed three blissful, if hectic, months. And Lois wrote Mom of their life there. We have a darling little cottage in Miami. Of course, I have to walk two miles to get the groceries, but I don't mind at all. Later, they had a tiny but adequate cottage near Daytona Beach. Then, Tony got his overseas orders. The letter he wrote his mother just before going was sober but typical. Please don't think I consider it a sacrifice. I'm glad to accept it, as are all the fellows in my outfit. It's not a sacrifice we want for other generations to have to make, though. And that's why we're anxious to do our part and help make the world a peaceful, wonderful place it could be and was designed to be. Lois will go back home and finish college. Mom... I keep thinking of thoughtful things I can do for her all through our lives together. Well, Tony fought Japs and jungles at Munda, at Guadalcanal, at Rabal. And at Bougainville, he joined the Fathers Who Have Never Seen Their Babies Club. Fifty-five combat missions he stacked to his credit, 253 combat hours. And finally, at long last, the miracle. He was sent back to the States, back to Lois and his tiny baby daughter. Lois had finished college, had earned the highest scholarship honor, Phi Beta Kappa. And now she was ready and eager to set up housekeeping near the very various bases to which Tony was sent as an instructor. In one city, the only place they could find was a fashionable hotel. And Lois said they grew very tired of eating out, and it was especially difficult with the baby. Then came a jubilant letter from a famous naval base. Lois wrote, Mom, here we are actually living in a Quonset hut. You've seen pictures of them, uh, made of what looks like corrugated iron and shaped like an iron lung with a stovepipe in it. The windows don't open wide, just the doors. But after his time in the jungles and the hotel, Tony loves being in a home of his own. He craves home-cooked meals, which he gets cooked in anything I can find. I baked a cake in a refrigerator tray the other day. I guess it was a success. Anyway, Tony boasted about it to his fellow Marines, said I could cook anything. Well, they asked if I could make real lemon pie. He admitted I could, the wretch, though he'd never seen or tasted one I'd made. 
But there I was, scheduled to make a real honest-to-goodness like Mother used to bake lemon pie for 15. Some of the men were just back from the Pacific and hadn't tasted real lemon pie for months. Their cook had served them a deadly concoction made from powdered eggs with lemon flavoring. And no meringue. It was so pale, it was almost white. Well, now, making lemon pie for 15 guests is an undertaking for a bride under the best of conditions. But Lois faced her ordeal with a temperamental oven, no pie pan, no measuring cup or spoon, no flour sifter or grater or egg beater, not even a sharp knife to cut the lemons with. So I think she had courage even to try, don't you? But she said she didn't want to let Tony down, and here is her account of making the pie. I used a half-pint cream bottle for a measuring cup. Uh, that's what a regular measuring cup holds, half a pint. And then I just fluff the flour up with my hands instead of sifting it the way the recipe says. Then I used a long olive bottle for a rolling pin, and my mixing board was the wooden drain board of the sink. I stretched a towel over it and thumb tacked it to the board. Then I had to use frying pans for my three pies. Fortunately, there were three frying pans. Only one was so big that I had to leave the oven door open so the handle could stick out. The pie crust really did bake beautifully in spite of all that. When it came to making three times the recipe for the filling, Lois had to cook it in a huge kettle. The eggs she beat with a fork. But grating the lemon rind presented her biggest problem, she wrote. I had to scrape and pick the rind off the lemons with a paring knife that may have been sharp once. It took hours. Tony whipped up the egg whites for the meringue with a fork, the way I'd beaten the yolks. And believe it or not, those pies were a success. None of the other wives had thought I could possibly do it. This bride didn't cross the country in a covered wagon, nor did she collect wild berries and vegetables for their food, nor cook over an open fire. But I claim the pioneer spirit of our great-grandmothers is just as apparent in young brides today like this one, even though the conditions under which they live are so very different. Lois was certainly just as ingenious as the pioneer women who made lemon pies from vinegar. And can't you just picture how proud Tony was that his wife could provide his friends with a real lemon pie they've been longing for all those months? Well, today I'm going to give you a menu for the sort of homey meal every bride ought to know how to prepare for her husband. Of course, when you think of preparing a meal that will go to a man's heart, you think of steak. For all men seem to love steak. So I'm going to give you a recipe for a kind of steak you can all manage to serve with food supplies as they are now. We call it emergency steak, and it's just as tasty and tender and appetizing as any tenderloin or porterhouse. Serve it sizzling hot from the broiler or pan, attractively garnished with green parsley or green carrot tops or celery tops, and a few bright red radishes as a bit of color in contrast to the juicy brown steak. No one could ask for a more delicious dinner meat. Really, everyone who's tried this emergency steak is crazy about it. Here is the recipe perfected by our staff for six servings. A bride could make half the recipe. Mix together one pound of ground beef or hamburger, one half cup milk, one cup of Wheaties, One teaspoon salt. One quarter teaspoon pepper. And one tablespoon of finely chopped onion, if desired. Pat into the shape of a T-bone steak. One inch thick. On a pie pan or broiler. Broil 8 to 15 minutes according to whether you want it rare or well done. Now, if you don't have a broiler pan, pan broil in a heavy pan on top of the stove. And don't you think that's a wonderful way to stretch one pound of meat to serve six? It's also another way in which plentiful cereal foods like Wheaties can be used to extend a less plentiful food like meat. And I'm going to suggest a combination of vegetables to go with steak. Carrots, celery, and cabbage, or just carrots and cabbage, or green beans and carrots. Any of these are naturals in flavor to complement the rich flavor of steak. 
You see, rather strong-flavored vegetables hold their own nicely with steak and therefore give eating satisfaction. But for a bride who hasn't learned the technique of managing the cooking of several different foods at one time, this idea of cooking two or three kinds of vegetables in one saucepan is very practical, I think. And I want to tell you just how I'd cook them to be extra tasty and yet save butter. Cook them with salad oil right in with the vegetables and water. For three to four cups of the raw vegetables, cut up fine, use two tablespoons salad oil and just enough salted water to evaporate during the cooking in a tightly covered pan. Start with only one quarter cup water and try it that way. Three to four cups of vegetables make four servings. And the easiest way to cut them up fine, incidentally, is to use a big knife and a board. Hold the knife at the tip with the left hand while you hold the handle with the right hand. Chop down through the vegetables one way, then crosswise the other way, until they're the size you like. Serve them around the brown steak on your hot platter, just as you would whole vegetables. Or place the brown meat on one end of the platter and pile the vegetables on the other end. You can serve your potato on the same platter, too. The potato piled on one end, the vegetables on the other, and the meat in the middle. Don't you find that this plan of serving several foods on one platter makes a picture of the food and helps appetite appeal? And, of course, you'll want a tossed green salad with a zippy French dressing. Try putting a little extra dry mustard in the dressing when you serve this emergency steak. It gives just the right tang. Of course, every bride wants to learn to make the sort of pies that men associate with home and dream about when they're away, or luscious, fudge-like chocolate cake. For chocolate cake and lemon pie are top dessert favorites among husbands here in these United States. And the folders we pack in each sack of our gold medal, kitchen-tested and rich flour, will give the beginning cook easy-to-follow recipes for such desserts. Right now, many women are finding in their gold medal flour a recipe for two-in-one cake, made by our new speed method. You'll recognize it as old-fashioned marble cake. It's a combination of smooth, satiny chocolate cake and tender, fluffy white. What's more, our staff have added a footnote to this recipe explaining how white corn syrup can be used for part of the sugar. One can even serve this cake fresh from the oven without icing. It will be delicious with fresh fruit for dessert. So I hope you'll all look for this cake recipe in your newest stack of gold medal flour or write to me for a copy of it. The recipe is economical and so easy to follow and so sure to turn out just right when used with dependable gold medal flour. And I'll be very glad to send a copy of our new bulletin, Our Nation's Rations, to those of you who would like it. It contains many recipes for main dishes, as well as menus and other cooking hints our staff have planned, especially to fit your wartime food supplies. I know you'll like it. Goodbye. Friends, just write to Betty Crocker, General Mills, Minneapolis 15, Minnesota, for this wartime bulletin, Our Nation's Rations. But be sure to specify the bulletin or any special recipe you may want. Betty Crocker comes to you with the good wishes of General Mills. Marching along together, sharing every smile and tear. Marching along together, wishing to the skies are clear. Marching along together, life is wonderful, sight, life's love. The last hour of entertainment has come to you with the best wishes of General Mills. We'll be back Monday with more of the same fine drama and hymns of all churches. This is Charles Lyon, your host on the General Mills Hour, saying see you then. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Uh.